better term. I'd, for want of a better term, I, I've used this, this phrase, analytical parsimony, uh, and I'll try and explain that in a bit more detail shortly, but the guiding principle is that uh, is when you're trying to undertake this kind of uh, study, uh, it's, it's, it's a means of anchoring a study. Uh, it's a narrative which is built around these, what you might call unifying overarching themes. Uh, it's especially the case for a book more than an article, which is by definition more focused. And it's especially uh, for, uh, for a broad country study. And to confess uh, a bit uh, with disclosure, the reason why I'm coming at it in a way is partly curiosity, but partly also because I don't know whether you can see this ancient tome, but this is the second edition of my Cambridge University Press book on the Indonesian economy, uh, published in the year 2000. And for the last 21 years, I've been thinking, do I do a third edition or not? And who knows whether it'll happen, but that's kind of where I'm coming from as well as just the general issues. So uh, this confession about being an economist, so as an economist, uh, uh, the big issue for us, maybe the, the major issue for us, is to try and understand how and why some countries seem to perform, quote unquote, better than others. And perform, of course, has lots of, lots of uh, subjective uh, issues in it. So I'll put them aside for a minute but while recognising the, the importance of it. But uh, I am trying to ask myself the question, when you think about the Indonesian economy, or you think about, you know, the Philippine economy, or you think about maybe Indonesian politics or something else, uh, can you think of a kind of overarching narrative, which in a sense holds the work together? Now, I think some of the, the best of these studies, I think typically have a disciplinary home, that is the author's uh, expertise and interest, but they, the best of them also make an attempt, however foolhardy in some cases, to actually uh, try and cross disciplinary boundaries, or at the very least to be aware of what other disciplines are thinking about this same broad question. And, and as I say, especially political science, um, where I think economics and politics are such close uh, bedfellows. Uh, the other point just to emphasize, um, and not just because Robert Cribb is, is here, uh, is, a, is the importance of taking history seriously. And I'll emphasize that quite a bit in the presentation. While, while saying taking ser history seriously is a, is a, is a um, primary consideration, I do want to emphasize um, that I don't think countries are prisoners of history necessarily. And that's exemplified by what I regard as the great Asian economic turning points of the 20th century when countries with decades of stagnation, sometimes centuries of stagnation, actually began to achieve quite rapid socio-economic development. And so you think of Indonesia from the late 60s, China from the late 70s, Vietnam uh, from the late 80s, uh, India from the early 90s and so on. So the turning point story has to be juxtaposed alongside the historical considerations. Just to give you a bit of an illustration of some of the works I'm thinking of, I'll just quickly go through some of these uh, book examples. By the way, uh, the Department of Political and Social Change has some great examples too, I should mention, and just to some, some very obvious important ones are uh, Ed's uh, Democracy for Sale, um, Paul Hutchcroft's <coughs> uh, Booty Capitalism still resonates in Indonesia, and many others, of course. So this is one example. This is, I think, probably Latin America's most eminent economist, Sebastian Edwards from Chile, UC Los Angeles, talking about the basic dilemma of Latin American development as he sees it. Uh, here's, a, I think, a very important book. Uh, probably most of you will know it, Why Nations Fail, um, a great book, takes history very seriously. And it's also written by a political scientist and an economist together, Essa Moglu and Robinson. Uh, this is one of the most important books in economics in the last couple of years, uh, just to illustrate, uh, again, with, with a very important theme running through the book, Radical Uncertainty, these two eminent British economists right from the establishment. King was the former governor of the Bank of England, uh, and they're really lambasting economics for missing out on quite a big story as they see it. Uh, another classic, uh, Paul Collier from Oxford, uh, The Bottom Begin, I think it's a classic on a study of African economic development and how to think about focusing on what are the primary problems of, that is, of endemic poverty. Uh, 
another classic, an economic history book, this time is different. These two famous economists actually saying, um, Carmen and Rogoff say that actually each one is not different. There are recurring themes in every crisis. And just for completeness, here's one from Australia, which I think is pretty important. Uh, okay, so the way I want to present the topic, and by the way, please interrupt me uh, if you want to along the way. Um, I'll just briefly mention some caveats uh, and some preliminaries. Um, I'll also give what I think are some important contextual factors in thinking about the topic, and then I'll go to the main part of the topic, which is this search for analytical parsimony. So uh, I mentioned some of these uh, points already. It's an elusive search. Um, I give quite a lot of country illustrations, or if you like, typologies. And I'm doing that not, not because I know much about the countries necessarily that I refer to, but because they are sort of stylized examples of a certain genre of economic and political development. So I'm generalizing without a lot of deep knowledge in many cases. Uh, I'm also conscious of the danger of trying to force the narrative into a, a sort of an unsatisfactory straitjacket, which I think is, is a methodological conundrum we social scientists often have to think about and deal with, uh, the narrative and even the facts sometimes. Uh, just a confession also that I'm more familiar, familiar with the economics literature, so I'm conscious I may be missing out on vast areas of politics and elsewhere. Uh, and just to emphasize again, I don't think countries are necessarily path dependent. The way we would think about Sukarno's Indonesia and Suhado's Indonesia differs from the way we think about the democratic era. As the world's most famous economist said, when the facts change, I change my mind. Uh, but there are some durable uh, paradigms and themes. So um, another caveat is, in a sense, you'll see in the presentation that in some ways, I think it's easier to say what Indonesia isn't, i.e. that is that theories, uh, propositions, hypotheses that don't fit easily. And in fact, in some ways, that's perhaps my, my principal conclusion that after this rather forlorn search, I don't necessarily come up with a sort of, you know, a convincing one liner, if you like. Uh, the other point to make is that there'll be lots of issues I discuss in the presentation of, you know, country characteristics and examples and typologies almost all of them to some degree would fit Indonesia and in fact almost all countries but I'm looking for what I regard as the kind of dominant narrative uh, not not these additional points. Final point to mention um, on um, <laughs> since I'm talking mainly to a political science audience uh, economists love statistics and arguably we love them uh, too much, uh, but uh, I'll make it I promise largely fact free but I can't resist just mentioning a couple of things just to illustrate sort of where I'm coming from and which does set up my thinking a bit. Uh, the first is that for all the development challenges I'm gonna talk about for Indonesia, it is, um, it is undeniably in a very special group of countries. Uh, and this, the Growth Commission, a big study done a bit over a decade ago, asked the question, how many countries have grown fast for at least a decade? There are only 13 of them, almost all in East Asia and Indonesia is one of them. So it's, it's worth keeping that in mind, at least it's in my mind as a consideration. The other point just to emphasize is, and perhaps more importantly, is living standards have undeniably improved a lot. Lots of caveats, of course, to be attached to this. It's, I know it's a very sweeping generalization, but uh, there are, the, the, the improvements in living standards have been undeniable, I think, at least I'm going to argue and happy to discuss. And the best indicator probably comparatively are these headcount poverty measures. And so Indonesia went from uh, on this so-called World Bank international poverty line, went from 94% below the poverty line in 1981 to um, 33% in 2015. So th there's a longer period of data, but the comparative data uh, give it in this format. So just trying to think, I'm thinking of Indonesia for all the problems we're going to discuss in that kind of context. Okay, so um, also on preliminaries, just a few contextual remarks, perhaps that's a better term than stylized facts, but I just want to quickly run through these before I get to what I think or hope will be the substance of the presentation. So uh, I wouldn't dare talk about history in any, to this kind of audience in any detail, but just the two things which keep in my mind all the time are, the legacy of the centuries of colonial rule 
very nicely summed up in this quote by Asim Moglu Robinson, and in fact drawing on uh, our Tony Reid's uh, seminal studies of the 1990s, uh, the, the impact of colonialism was to, in a sense, leave a legacy of a, a understandable suspicion, reservation of you know, globalization, of economic liberalism, and so on. Uh, and the second point just to emphasize was how poor Indonesia was um, in the mid-1960s. So uh, the famous development economics book of the time by our friend Ben Higgins, who spent his last 15 years at ANU, he said Indonesia is a chronic economic dropout. Uh, and then he had this quote, he wrote this really nice forward to Clifford Geertz's Agricultural Involution, which I think sort of summed up a lot of the thinking at the time, but maybe not applicable now. Um, okay, so that's, that's, my, that's my one minute on history. I'm just trying to, again, contextualise for myself at least. Secondly, I think, um, I think of Indonesia, I think of geography in many dimensions, but the two in particular I think are important, at least for my narrative, are first of all, the neighbourhood story. And the name, by that I mean uh, this, uh, this East Asian region, which has been the world's most dynamic economically for the last 50 years. And I think it has a positive kind of spillover effect, if you like. Uh, lots of successful uh, outward looking economies, um, which, which, in, which in a sense have these effects, ripple effects throughout the region. Um, the famous Indonesian economist, uh, Mari Pangestu now at the World Bank called it <coughs> competitive liberalization, trying to keep up with the neighbors or watch the neighbors and learn from them. And that also includes ASEAN itself. Um, so another big topic I won't get into, but in some ways the so-called little red dot uh, is of outsized importance. And I'm referring to Singapore uh, as a model, a model for the economic development, not for political development, I guess you'd say. Second part of geography, which I think is important, is it is Indonesia is the world's largest archipelagic nation state, and that has lots of implications for how we think about the trajectory of economic development. It means that central government has to think very carefully about holding the country together. Uh, there's infrastructure challenges, getting, thing, getting infrastructure into the, if not 17,000 islands, 10,000 islands plus. And this unusual geography next to these very open economies has led some Indonesian wags to say Indonesia was made by God for free trade. I don't know who originated that term. It might have in fact been Murray, Murray's father, the late Pang Lakim, I'm not sure. Uh, a third stylized fact or contextual factor to think about uh, is net in thinking about the conditioning factors, if you like, is Indonesia's natural resource endowments. Uh, again, lots of implications flow from this. Uh, big literature on the so-called Dutch disease. Indonesians, of course, say they had two Dutch diseases, centuries of Dutch colonialism and then this resource abundance. Uh, big debate about whether it's a blessing or a curse. A key point, I think, is Indonesia is different from the, the resource poor uh, Northeast Asian economies, putting Singapore in Northeast Asia analytically, because uh, for those countries, uh, as Perkins and others have emphasized, if they wanted to get rich, they had to get rich by being uh, efficient export oriented economies to make things for the rest of the world. And whereas Indonesia is much more, much more resource, uh, much better resource endowed than these countries. And I think that has huge implications for the way institutions in the countries evolve, because um, it, the calculus of, of rent seeking institutions, that is the grab for rents in the natural resource sector versus efficiency seeking where the emphasis is on being internationally competitive. Uh, natural resource endowments also has implications for economic management, which I'll discuss a bit later on. Uh, moving on, uh, fourthly, ethnic diversity. Um, uh, I'm just mentioning this fairly briefly. It's, I'm mentioning it because in the economic development literature, it's a big deal, much of it Africa focused, arguing that high ethnic diversity or fragmentation uh, has been a, a major obstacle to economic development. Uh, and, uh, and especially if ethnicity and inequality are highly correlated as they often are in, in Africa in particular, South Africa, the classic example, but many others, and also in Latin America, Brazil, for example. 
Question is, is it relevant for Indonesia? And I think it's not nearly as relevant as it, is, as it made out to be in the literature on Africa, uh, but it's, it's clearly important. Uh, it explains, of course, why there are, <coughs> Indonesia still has some disaffected regions, uh, Papua, Aceh. Um, it's, why, it's why it shapes uh, implicit affirmative action programs and quite a bit else. Uh, final um, stylized fact, just to emphasize uh, a recurring theme in thinking about Indonesia is this, uh, the divide between macroeconomic policy making and microeconomic policy making. So I'm just simplifying and going over this very quickly, but I think the key point is that since the late 1960s and perhaps earlier, Indonesia has generally had a, a fairly strong and professional uh, set of macroeconomic policy institutions, principally finance ministry and Bank Indonesia, and they've been supported and indeed protected by legislative measures. We're seeing this play out at the moment with the relaxation temporarily of the fiscal law. And that sits alongside, uh, in contrast to the line ministries in Indonesia, which are, I guess it would be fair to say, of variable quality, uh, and much closer to their constituencies and sometimes in fact captured by them. Um, and so this has been a recurring theme of both the Suharto era and the democratic eras. Uh, and of course it's mediated by the president and shaped by external circumstances, but it is actually important to note this recurring theme it manifested initially in a thing called, people came to call Sudley's law named after the famous uh, technocrat, Mohammed Sadi, a, a wonderful and great person. Uh, and that was bad times make good policies and good times sometimes the reverse. Other people have talked about this as well. Uh, the late Hadi Sassastro uh, did, uh, Hadi Basri did, in fact, in his AMU PhD dissertation. Uh, question is whether it's still applicable to the same degree. And just to note the, the very important paper, I think, by uh, my good friend Acho and also Shamsu on the Lowy paper, wondering whether it's still applicable as much. Okay, so that's that's the that's setting up some of the context and preliminaries. Um, and now I go on to what I think is I hope is going to be the substance of the paper, but conscious of the time. Um, Greg, should I pause here for a minute or or just keep going? I think just keep going, Hal, and then better to have the discussion um, in a consolidated way at the end of your presentation. Okay, good. So um, from here on, uh, I'm discussing various, um, again, I'm using the word stylized models, country characteristics, for want of a better phrase. What I'm trying to do here is to say, does Indonesia fit any of these models neatly or does it do we need to think about it in another way so let me just take you through fairly quickly what some of these uh, common sort of model descriptions of developing countries are at least by again i'm emphasizing by economists so first of all um, could it be considered quote unquote a development state well what is a development state or developmental state uh, it's generally associated with japan and the four Newly industrializing economies, uh, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong. And it had at least two connotations as I read this literature. Uh, first of all, that uh, economic growth was the overriding objective, uh, pushing aside almost all opposition to what was considered to be the de desired outcomes and the policy uh, to implement them mostly by authoritarian states. And in fact, of those five countries, all but Japan were clearly authoritarian in the stage the literature was talking about them. And secondly, and related, they had typically uh, insulated bureaucracies. I'm not quite sure who, who invented this term. Was it Steph Haggard or somebody? But I think it's quite appropriate. Uh, they had insulated bureaucracies protected from the sort of political processes, the political hurly-burly and able to do what they thought was the best thing for the country. In some ways, it links back to an earlier literature uh, on, um, from the famous uh, Gunnar Myrdal concept of hard state, you know, hard state versus soft state. Now, it's a big literature. I won't try and discuss it in any detail, but just, to, just there, is a, there are lots of sort of parallel literatures stemming from it. Perhaps the most controversial, most interesting in some ways was the one by the late Alice Amston saying that states deliberately got prices wrong. 
she was thinking about career in particular. Uh, I don't want to debate this much. There's mixed evidence for it. Um, uh, there were the common elements of being export oriented and prudent macroeconomic policy, strong emphasis on education. A key point is that because they were strong states, um, a lot of the intervention, uh, firm level, industry level, was highly conditional and demanded, demanded uh, performance fairly quickly. So question is, um, is it a useful descriptor for Indonesia? Uh, I think for periods it was, but I wouldn't say it's a dominant, a dominant story. You might say it's a, a useful descriptor for Indonesia uh, when uh, Patwi Joyo and others were running the economy for a decade from the late 1960s, and again when Ali, Ali Wadana was running it during the 1980s when Indonesia avoided uh, a really serious crisis again. Uh, so that's the subtly bad times, good policy story again. Uh, but as a, as a descriptor of broad economic development strategy, I don't think it's correct, um, especially at the, at the micro uh, trade and industry level where these interventions often occurred. Uh, it was, it's always been contested for Indonesia. I like this quote from Dede, Hati Basri, summarising his PhD dissertation on the political economy of protection in Indonesia said, governments may not be good at picking winners, but losers are good at picking governments. And I think in a way that does summarise the story a bit. In the democratic era also, um, I don't think it's a really convincing uh, a narrative. And just as an illustration, I checked recently, Indonesia's had seven trade ministers in the past decade, and they've had very different views and, and objectives. And trade is where a lot of these kind of interventions uh, manifest themselves. Uh, also, industry policy has been pretty muddled. Uh, Acho mentioned this very nicely, very recently actually, pointing out the contradiction between the government's professed desire to join global value chains with a parallel desire to increase domestic value added. You, you can't have both. Um, so, so I think that development state, by the way, I note also Eve's done some important uh, writing on this, including in her dissertation, I guess. Uh, but I don't find this a really convincing uh, characterization of Indonesia, except in parts and for periods. Uh, a second, a second, uh, a second uh, um, characteristic or, or stylized fact has been uh, this literature, big literature on countries which are fiscally adventurous and crisis prone. So the story here is um, countries which have recurring economic crises, and they, these typically, not always of course, but typically arise from the conjunction of weak fiscal capacity, uh, unable to generate enough um, revenue to provide the services that the public expects, or which the political class promises. So the, the, the narrative goes, it's uh, governments start borrowing a lot, they get into, they, the debt rises, and there's typically a trigger, often an external shock, which sets off a major economic crisis, uh, a big, and the debts can't be repaid, or there has to be a, a painful IMF um, uh, rescue package. So lots of country examples fit this model pretty well. Uh, Argentina is arguably the classic. Uh, Argentina has had 21 IMF arrangements since the mid-50s. Pakistan, another classic, uh, 13 IMF bailouts in its independent history. Sri Lanka, Chandra Atakorla told me recently, has had 17 IMF programs since 1960. Um, when I was working in Mongolia a couple of years ago, they, they're doing pretty well too. They've had six IMF packages since 1990. So uh, cautious, be, being cautious about the terminology, they mean different things in different cases, but the general story is recurring crises originating from um, basically from the budget. Uh, there's a special case also of the so-called boom and bust petroleum states, which is back to the resource curse hypothesis. Uh, hypothesis. And the classic example here probably is Nigeria. And, and by the way, I should have emphasized earlier I'm using country examples where I think they're useful, especially when there's some similarities with Indonesia. So you think of big, relatively resource, resource rich developing countries like Nigeria or Brazil and others. And Nigeria, Indonesia was uh, a favoured comparison for quite a long time because they were in a sense so similar around 1970. In fact, Nigeria was a bit uh, wealthier than Indonesia, had better education and other indicators. And now Indonesia is um, 
has a per capita income more than double Nigeria's, the famous work of Collier and others. Uh, the key point to note here is that Indonesia doesn't fit this model uh, it, remotely. Uh, in, the, in the 50 years before COVID, um, uh, Indonesia had really only had one major economic crisis, which tells you something about the quality of its macroeconomic management. And that, that crisis was, of course, the Asian financial crisis, 1997, 98. And that really wasn't caused by, by what you might call irresponsible fiscal budgetary policy. So I think the story is one here of learning from history, the legacy of the 1960s hyperinflation, when Bank Indonesia's note printing facility broke down. Uh, and so governments have been cautious more or less ever since. Uh, of course, uh, I'm not saying macro policy is perfect. Uh, it's not. Uh, the tax effort is really almost anemic in many respects. I'll talk about this later uh, below. A uh, lot of bud off-budget activity, especially in the Suharto era, and lots of corruption, which I'll talk about a bit later. But these factors aren't triggers for the macroeconomic crisis of the kind we're talking. So that's the second um, characteristic which I'm ruling out. Uh, a third one uh, is uh, this, this characterization of countries as being unequal, stratified states, often popular states. That's back to the Sebastian Edwards uh, story uh, of sort of macroeconomic populism not solving a, a deep seated problem of endemic poverty. So how does this stack up with Indonesia? Well, I think the poverty story is very clear, as I tried to show in the table earlier. Um, most most uh, social indicators have improved a lot since the late 1960s. Uh, not all, of course, and we can discuss the exceptions to that. Uh, there, you know, there are serious regional poverty traps. There are lots of data issues, intra-household inequality and so on. But the main story is one of broad based, I think, improvements in living standards. And it's been mainly um, driven by economic growth, um, something economists kind of take for granted, but other disciplines often sort of aren't really convinced by or, or have some reservations about. Uh, that's the poverty story. And again, I'm going across a big topic, um, you know, very quickly. The inequality story is, isn't as clear. Uh, it's uh, inequality is more difficult to measure in the surveys, the household surveys, Susanas, the top end often isn't collected properly. There are lots of dimensions of inequality, um, interpersonal, regional, gender, age, and they're not all moving in the same direction. And it's certainly true that uh, interpersonal inequality in Indonesia has risen during much of the democratic era, especially from roundabout, if we believe the stats, from round about the early 2000s to about 2017 or so. But the key point is Indonesia doesn't really stand out as being a very high inequality country comparatively. And to emphasize again, I'm thinking comparatively on almost everything when I, when I talk about it. So the following graph will be unintelligible for anybody without a microscope. I just got it recently from somewhere. Uh, so it's just showing us the Gini coefficient, the standard measure of inequality for consumption or income. And Indonesia is sort of about in the middle. You can see it somewhere fairly in the, between the 35th and 40th in the Gini for income and 80 to 85 for wealth. So it's not a high, not a high income inequality country. Uh, it is, it's wealth inequality does look to be higher. That's one question which I'm, we need to think about a bit more. It probably has fairly high wealth inequality and also corporate concentration. But just to note, the data for wealth inequality are really pretty weak. Uh, the best thing is the world inequality uh, database, um, but caveats, they have to be careful with it. So thinking about this uh, inequality issue a bit more, I think it's also important to keep in mind a few other factors. First of all, Indonesia hasn't really never had the inherited agrarian inequality, like, for example, Latin America, a lot of Latin America, and like, for example, neighbouring Malaysia and the Philippines. There's also been um, a lot of high end wealth destruction during the Asian financial crisis, uh, also earlier during the nationalisations of 
of uh, the estates and mining sector in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, another point to keep in mind is the state enterprise sector in Indonesia is unusually large. So the question is how we think about state enterprises in the overall context of wealth inequality. And I guess uh, I'm, I'm not really sure about this point, but I guess Indonesia doesn't have the social stratification, which maybe arises from monarchies. I, I, I wouldn't want to emphasize that point too much, but it's always struck me when I'm working on Malaysia, <laughs> this factor is much more relevant than it is for Indonesia, for example. And in a way, uh, Jomo's original book, um, his PhD dissertation, sort of brought that point out pretty clearly. So um, before I leave this topic, a, a few additional points just to emphasize. Um, first key point is that Indonesia is different from the Latin American classic stereotype of Edwards left behind the false promise of populism. And that's because it doesn't have this link between recurring macroeconomic crises uh, and a failure to address poverty. That's the first point. Uh, second point is um, Indonesia's inequality which of course is substantial, I'm not saying it's an equal society at all, but it does differ from countries like, uh, for example, South Africa and Brazil, which not only have very high inequality, higher than Indonesia, but the inequality and other social indicators, poverty and so on, correlate pretty closely with ethnicity and or race. So that's another distinguishing feature. A third point just to emphasize is, for this, we, for this sort of story, we really need not just snapshots of data, but panel data, that is tracking the same individuals or households over time to see what's happened to them. That is, do the poor always stay poor, for example. We don't have really comprehensive data on that uh, from the Susanus, the main survey, uh, but um, oh, um, there'll be a bit of noise in the background. The sign of the times, the Woolworths delivery is arising, uh, arriving, I mean, and arising too. Uh, so we don't have this sort of panel data comprehensively, but we do have this guy called Ferman Mitula. <laughs> Hi, Ferman, if you're listening, and the Indonesian Family Life Survey, which is really pioneering work. And equally pioneering has been work by a, a former student, Matthew Wei Poi, now at the World Bank, who actually has, they've done some work trying to understand what's been happening to the poor over time, that is the same people over time. So I won't I won't bore you with all the details of this table, which was compiled by Matt on the basis of, of Furman's data, but and, and a lot of data here. Um, you can trust me, I'm an economist. Just just take it, take my word for it. But if you want to look at the fourth bottom line on the poor, it tells you that in 1993, compared to 2014, 24 percent of the poor were still poor. Um, you know, 21 years later, another 24 percent had graduated to the next class up. 40, 42% had graduated further and 10% had actually uh, got into the sort of middle class. So it's just trying to tell you that there isn't this deep rooted endemic poverty. Uh, yes, sorry, that's Woolies again. Um, as much as in certainly in the Latin American and African stories as I read them. The other point just to note is um, we're thinking about inequality, Indonesia has not been an activist redistribution state, like, by the way, most of East Asia and Southeast Asia. This just tells you what happens to the inequality uh, over time from the initial point, so-called market income, through to the final income after these um, taxes and transfers take place. Indonesia is the dark line and it, there's not a lot of movement these data are uh, 2014, I think, and maybe this bit 2012. It's been a bit more since the the Bansos programs really began to develop. But um, Indonesia is not a major redistribution state, partly because historically inequality wasn't as high as other countries. So that was the fourth point in these sort of uh, additional points to think about. So bottom line, um, I don't think Indonesia is. Um, I don't think Indonesia could be characterized as a highly unequal stratified state. There's certainly plenty of inequality, but I don't think it's a dominant characteristic. Uh, moving on. Okay, so uh, plenty of other characterizations we could 
talk about. Uh, I'll just mention some briefly. Some of them are a bit related. Um, uh, is Indonesia a predatory state or in Esamoglu Robinson's terminology, is it a sort of extortionist extractive state or their alternative of, a, of an inclusive state? Uh, there are, of course, elements of these, these factors present, but I think it's difficult to sustain the argument that, um, that Indonesia um, is one of these since it's had this fairly broad based improvement in living standards. Uh, is it a highly corrupt state? Well, yes, a lot of corruption in Indonesia, as in most countries. Is it a dominant characteristic of Indonesia and compared to what? Well, I'm not sure. I think Indonesia ranks about average on lots of these indices across countries, um, you know, relative to its income group. Incidentally, um, one of the challenges in this wonderful book, Why Nations Fail, one of the challenges in thinking about it is how do you, how do you put a country like Indonesia into their kind of categories? Was it extortionist, extractive, or was it inclusive? And uh, as I tried to argue in an article once, Suharto's Indonesia clearly had a bit of both, uh, inclusive and extractive. And you might say the same about the democratic era. Uh, other characterizations, um, often there's, there's often this uh, description of a sort of narco state or quasi narco, narco state with huge illegality, which in a sense permeates the political class and, and also development outcomes. Mexico and Colombia are the two countries most often mentioned in this context. Again, Indonesia has plenty of illegality, but I wouldn't put it in this kind of category, at least. Um, another, another typology is these conflict-ridden uh, states, and in a sense, because states lack, their, lack a sense of national identity and co coherence. The classic case of uh, Myanmar, I guess, since independence is perhaps a good, a very good example, or countries which have had protracted civil wars, again, DRC, Congo, uh, other, other nations, including sadly Sri Lanka, and in a different sense, uh, countries like Thailand, which I think on latest count has had 20 constitutions since the end of absolute monarchy, and it sort of indicates an unsettled um, political compact, I guess you could say. So how do these Again, sweeping generalizations are fit with Indonesia. Well, again, of some relevance, but I don't think they're the dominant story. There are some relevance from the point of view of conflict, clearly, uh, Permesta, the events of the mid 1960s and 97, 98, of Aceh, Timor, what people are now calling the Papuan tragedy. Um, and um, in some ways, I like, I think I've got your quote right, Robert, Robert Cribb. In some ways, it's almost remarkable that modern Indonesia still largely corresponds to the arbitrary lines drawn on a map by far off uh, European imperialists centuries ago. So I don't think any of these factors really fit Indonesia uh, neatly. But of course, there are elements which are, which are present. So the unifying factors, I think, have been really quite important for Indonesia, starting, of course, with the, the genius of the founding president, Sukarno. Uh, on these other indicators, you know. Well, if I just uh, just to note, um, yes, we've got about five minutes or so left. I just know you've got a few slides to get through, so just to warn you of the time. Thanks very much. Yes, I, I'm conscious that I better go a bit quicker. Uh, just on these, but on these various indicators of criminality and gangsters and so on, uh, you know, when I as I read the other countries' story, I just don't think Indonesia fits them all that well. But it, it, there are bits of it which matter. Okay, I'm getting towards the end of my typologies, and this is one which I guess I'm wrestling with the most. And it, it, could you call Indonesia an oligarchic state? I, I know this is a popular term, it's widely used. Uh, I guess Jeff Winter's book in some ways popularized it for Indonesia, but it's been around in uh, quite a long time. Uh, Dick Robinson's earlier pioneering work, an example of it. Uh, I'm ambivalent about this, and let me try and explain why. Uh, I, I see the attraction of it, the appeal of it, but I'm ambivalent. Uh, I, I think it's partly a semantic issue, um, and, and I tend to use the term conservatively, putting aside these special cases of one-party states with large state enterprise sectors like China and Vietnam. I'm thinking of it as a small group who essentially controls the state and its capacity to confer patronage access to resources. So the one I think of all the time, again, perhaps a bit simplistically, is Putin's Russia with a powerful state apparatus able to 
uh, eliminate or at least restrict people like uh, Navalny, op potential opposition, even the Nobel laureates. Um, uh, uh, but also they control the commanding heights of the economy. They had the ability to, to destroy or create businesses. So this is of some relevance to Suharto's Indonesia. Uh, that wonderful survey piece by uh, Jamie Mackey and, and Andrew McIntyre characterised Suharto in supreme control from 1982. It's also relevant for resource-rich economies and inward-looking economies where the state has, by definition, more control. And it's relevant for countries with uh, unequal, deeply entrenched inequality and for countries with large state enterprise sectors and complex regulatory regimes, the so-called Indian license raj, and also where the state bank, the state controls a lot of the banking sector. Is it useful for Indonesia? Yes and no. Um, that sounds like a cop out, doesn't it? But I think it's, I don't think it's a straightforward case. There are certainly predisposing factors which, which mean Indonesia resembles the oligarchic state model, its resource abundance, extensive control of the state banking sector, high wealth inequality with caveats and wealth is lightly taxed. But the no or maybe factors I think are relevant, that the major nationalisations of the past, uh, a lot of decentralisation to the region since 2001, the political process moderately open and so on. So I think there are open questions and I think more work is, needs to be done um, on this topic before, I would be convinced that that's, it's, it's, it's really the appropriate model for Indonesia. In some ways, I struggle with this topic a bit the same way that a very fine dissertation in your department a um, long time ago by some of you may remember, Peter Searle wrote on the Malaysian capitalist class. He called that really nice book, The Riddle of Malaysian Capitalism, Rent Seekers or Real Capitalists? Question mark. Okay, uh, so um, what's left? <laughs> what's left? Maybe nothing's left, but here's where I'm, my thoughts are kind of um, headed. And this, is, this is, Greg, where I'm just about finished. The more I think about Indonesia, the more I think of it as, 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 a, as something like a pragmatic but constrained state. Let me try and explain briefly. Uh, with hesitation, it's not a um, deeply analytical concept. It's not as neat as the brilliant books I, I showed you at the beginning. But uh, I, th I think this sort of framework um, centers on the fact that there uh, are various policy outcomes which are premised on Indonesia's leaders necessity to maintain what is sometimes called 5% economic growth. That was often Suharto's sort of the mantra about Suharto, but also the democratic era. So a pragmatic state means things like the following. Trade policy, the tension between distrust of globalization and liberalism, uh, the tension between that and the East Asian or ASEAN inevitability of being fairly open. That's, I call that pragmatism in trade policy. Uh, industry and technology policy. Uh, a lot of uh, Indonesian policymakers are attracted to this notion of guided industry policy using the earlier Japan model, the Korean model, whatever. Uh, but there's very little evidence of it actually being implemented coherently. Uh, in international uh, commercial policy, trade and other, and other uh, economic diplomacy, despite its size, Indonesia is really proactive. It's what Dede said, sitting on the fence. Uh, <laughs> that was a very good summary of it. Uh, in its macroeconomic policy, as I mentioned or tried to argue, that its, its macroeconomic policy has been pretty prudent since the, the deep crisis of the 60s. And of course, the, the importance of avoiding another IMF program. And so the technocracy has been relatively well insulated. But good macroeconomic policy is, is not a is a necessary but not sufficient condition for broader development. Another illustration where my ANU colleagues have quite, had quite a lot to say, um, the regional autonomy story, uh, clearly done in the, uh, a sensible response to the fears of territorial disintegration, so a sudden de uh, decentralization in 2001, uh, nicely described by Marcus and others, but little subsequent reform since 2001, nicely described by, by Blaine and others. Uh, education, uh, another example where there's the importance of universal literacy, but getting much beyond that, even with a budget mandate 
hasn't really led to major progress in developing a, a high quality uh, universal egalitarian education system. So this question again, the Sudley's law. So final slide, Greg. Um, uh, but it's a constrained state. In what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, again, uh, just to summarise a very big issue, uh, some illustrations. With a, a tax to GDP, a revenue effort of 11%, less of course during the crisis, it has. It's one of the lowest among upper middle income developing countries, which Indonesia will revert to again after the crisis. Uh, the government can't deliver the sort of services the community expects. Uh, across health, education, infrastructure, uh, with that kind of tax base, especially when more than a third of it goes direct to the regions anyway. Uh, a second illustration, I think, is the general absence of sweeping bureaucratic reform to, to develop a, a nucleus of a high quality bureaucracy. Um, sitting in Canberra, we've got to be careful to say, talk about that. I don't know whether we've got one either, but, but Indonesia, I think the absence of major bureaucratic reform through both the Suharto and the um, democratic era is, is quite striking. And that, I think, affects what the government can realistically be expected to do. A uh, third illustration is the knowledge, knowledge sector story. And, and here also, I think Indonesia uh, is severely constrained. Of course, dramatic improvements in literacy and, and, and school enrolments, uh, university enrolments. But uh, I think Indonesia is still a long way from going down the path of this sort of knowledge intensive economy, the way the successful uh, uh, Northeast Asian states, and now of course China, is, is doing it. Uh, the, the technology sector is still pretty underdeveloped, I guess, comparatively. And finally, uh, protecting the commons and the fact that Indonesia has this vast maritime forestry resources and its, uh, its struggles to, to protect them. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, Greg, I've gone a bit over time and very much looking forward to all your comments. Thanks very much.